everyone, and welcome to your final broadcast of How to Be a Data Scientist Python 101. In this video, John is going to be taking you through everything that you've learned so far, but we're also going to be encouraging you to start to interpret the data. Visualizing data using Python is a good way to determine what patterns and relationships between variables are present. However, a lot of interpretation involves thinking about the context of the data and why these patterns might be there. So as we take you through this last Jupyter notebook, we'll be asking you questions to encourage your thinking on this. Good luck, and here's John. Hello everyone, I'm John Goldring. I'm the core director of the QSTEP Centre at Manchester Met, and I'm here today to talk to you about the importance of the story when you've been doing statistics. Now I know you've been doing Python using Google Core Lab, which is really, really a fabulous skill to take into the workplace, but unless you've got the statistical literacy to know how to understand what you're talking about, uh, it's never going to be as powerful. Because the thing about numbers and the thing about statistics is they're really able to change lives. And I often remember about the difference between men and women and the pay. Now, it was in the 1970s, it was legal to pay men and women differently. But now it's not. It's a discrimination. But why is it we still have women who are getting paid much less than men when we talk about the average? So the point of all this is that data is really important, but it's much more persuasive when we start to tell a story. Okay, so I'm going to look at an example of the Titanic. Now, did you know there was 2,240 passengers and crew on the Titanic. Now, if you look at the slide, you'll see the number of people who were actually on board is much, much more than the people who were recorded to have either survived or who died in the Titanic. But when we start looking at more data, we can start thinking about the average age, we can start thinking of different percentages of people who survived, different percentages of people who died. Let's quickly look at the averages. You'll see on the slide that the average age, the mean age, for the, the person who, uh, for the people on board, were 29.699118. Come on, that's not an age. Yeah, we need to think about the story. What is the story? The story behind that is most people were quite young. The mean age of people on the Titanic, they were young. Let's look at the mode. And if you remember, the mode is when the most occurring number. And you can see we've only got one mode, so it's not bimodal. Uh, we've got one mode of 24. Again, that's pointing to the age of people on the Titanic as being quite young. And then if you look at the median, and you mean medium's dead in the middle. It's got as many as above, many above and as many below. That's 28. So the story behind that is that they were quite young. Why is that? Could it be that people were emigrating to America for the work because Europe was quite poor? The story you want to tell is really, really down to what you want to tell. But it's important that you do tell a story. Now, as a social scientist myself and a sociologist, I will always try and tell uh, a sociological story. But whatever you're studying, to try to tell that, study, that story. Right, look at the slide for the average cost of going on the Titanic to America. Now, the average, the mean average, is £32.20. I'm not going to go into all the decimal points, it detracts from the story. Okay, let's have a look at the mode. This is the most frequently occurring. It was £8.05. Now, the first thing what jumps out at me is that's a lot different. Okay, we were talking about 1912. That's still an awful lot of money, but it's very different from £32. Let's look at the medium, uh, that's dead in the middle, £14.45. Again, that's very different. All these numbers are very different. There's something going on here. I suggest this, this data is skewed. Let's have a look at the maximum, uh, the maximum cost of going on the Titanic. That's £512 compared to the minimum, which is not. How does that happen? Was that Leonardo DiCaprio sneaking on? I bet it was. But if you look at the standard deviation, there's a big clue in the standard deviation that it's, it's very, very big. And that tells us that the, the, the difference between all the different costs of going on the Titanic is quite diverse. And that's what really the important story is. So we know there's a lot of things going on. It's not just the average of £32. That doesn't tell us enough. Do you see that? Okay, so that's a story when you're using averages and measures of dispersion. But when we start looking at percentages, we can start to see a very different story taking place. Now look at the slide. You'll see that the number of people 
recorded as either survived or perished on the Titanic is 891. Well, that's very different from the number of people who are actually on. The passengers and crew were 2,240. So what's happening? Well, the first thing is measurement. We already know that safety issues weren't very good for the Titanic, hence it happened. But now they were measuring people. It wasn't really recorded. So that's the first thing we have to be noted, we'd have to be wary of. Okay, the second thing is, when we look at the 891, we can see that of those, women were 314, but there were a lot more men, there were 577. Okay, that's the total of people recorded, mind. Now, have a look at those who perished. There was 81 women who perished, uh, compared to 468 men. Now, that's a really interesting story in itself, but we already can see there were more men than women. So is this data, is this data any good? It is useful, but I think there's some things we need to think about to tell a better story. And that is, we start to use percentages. Now, if you look at the percentages slide, there's a very different story going on. Uh, remembering percentages is a standardized way of comparing things in my view. It's great at comparing groups in this instance, it's men and women. Okay, when we start looking at those who didn't survive in terms of female, we can see there was 14.75. Again, that's not a person, is it? So we need to take that up to 15. So 15% 15 of women didn't survive compared to males, which were 85%. So by using percentages, we can see there's an awful lot more males didn't survive. And we know it was women, children and first. So that was the culture. And again, this is the important story. We have to look at the context and the culture. When we're thinking about this, there was a lot of shrivelry taking place. Even though men wanted to get on board, uh, the disgrace to their, to their honour wouldn't have allowed them to. Uh, but look at those who survived. Obviously, that this should match. So in terms of females, there were 68% who survived compared to 31 uh, or 32%. Okay, so that's the important story you want to start telling. And this is what I think percentages are so useful. And this really contributes to you developing your statistical literacy. Okay, we've done percentages, we've done averages, but there are more things we can do with this. You've been taught how to code uh, categorically, but you can also record. So for example, the average age and the average cost, average cost of a ticket, they were scale variables. What if we wanted to explore them in, as a categorical variable? We can do this by recording them. Now you can see here, uh, with the bins equals, we've got 0 to 17. So they would be considered the youngest group. We've got 18 to 65, they'd be considered as the adults. And we've got 66 and above, 66 to 99. We're calling them the elders. Now when you start to record in, uh, this data you can start to tell a different story again and what's really interesting let's go straight to elders first thing we can see of all the people on the Titanic there were only eight we would consider uh, elders so there were the 66 and above so we already know through the averages that we had a very young uh, passenger list but this confirms this as well, doesn't it? Looking at the adults, you can see there were the majority. So if you remember the adults, recorded from 18 to 65. It's a pretty broad category, but it's useful in this instance because we can see there the more. So the majority of people would be in this category. Uh, and there were 770. But there were also quite a lot of children. There was more children than elders, wasn't there? Uh, 113. So again, this is all about telling the story uh, using statistics. And importantly, it's about increasing your statistical literacy by being able, being able to read this table and then report on this table. If you look at the journey you've been on, you've done averages, you've done the different types of averages. That's mean, median and mode. You've done measures of dispersion, you've done standard deviation, all really important things. And then you've had a look at the difference between frequencies, raw data, and the percentages, and how the percentages tell much more of a story. And then we've moved on and done cross tabs, and you've also done recording. So you've done all this on the Titanic data. What we'd like you to do now is do the same kind of re research on the Crime Survey of England and Wales, which has been made available to you in the code book. And what you can do again is focus on the stories. So we've looked at gender, for example. Uh, do you expect to see fear of being a victim of crime uh, to be gendered? I would argue that uh, women uh, are more likely to fear crime more than men. And it's not that women are more likely to be victims of crime, it's just that women are put in a more vulnerable position within our society. And equally, men feel much more uh, invulnerable. Uh, so that could be why people fear crime, because this isn't about how they've experienced crime. 
Okay, you could also think about age as well. Now, I would argue that older people are likely to fear crime more than younger people. But did you know it was or younger people are more likely to be victims of crime than older people? So again, these are really important stories you can start to tell using the actual data. I hope you've enjoyed doing this Python course, but the important takeaway from this is the stories you can tell. It's a great skill you've learned to be able to use Python, but if you can't tell a story from what your results are, people aren't going to listen as much. So, uh, practice a story. Practice a sociological or the criminological or the social science theories. These are all really important and make your data much more plausible. And remember, statistical literacy is a really, really important graduate skill. So, thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, we hope that last Jupyter Notebook got you thinking about ways that you can interpret data. As John said, coding as well as statistical literacy are incredibly versatile skills that you can use for a wide variety of things. And to demonstrate this, we have collected interviews from people that all use data and Python even though they're working in different fields and projects. So from researching climate change to working with AI to create a fictional language spoken by slime people, let's see the different things that you can do. What is your research about? Um, well, my research, basically I'm doing a thesis in my Masters of Marine Biological Resource Management and basically as we all know, the, the planet is warming uh, and that is resulting in sea surface temperature change. Um, <clears throat> and one of the places where this is affecting the most is in small scale fisheries. So small scale fisheries are the food provider for over 70% of the world. So it's really important for quite a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> and in Mexico, there's a place called Nayarit and that's been uh it's been identified as a hotspot for climate change so that means that the changes there are occurring more rapidly than other places in the world um so by identifying the how changes are occurring there you can sort of predict what will happen in the rest of the world in the future um and in this place there's this uh the small scale fisheries there so the fishermen they um, work with patrons and patrons are people who will either provide them a permit to fish or a boat or fishing gear so they work really closely with these people and they can sometimes affect how they adapt so for example if a patron only provides a fisherman a specific type of gear you know and then they realize that that species species of fish is no longer there because of due to changes in sea surface temperature how can they adapt to that change and how can they maintain their livelihood and what is happening at the moment so that's what we're trying to figure out how these relationships with patrons affect um the fisheries and why is that important well as i previously mentioned hotspots can be used to predict the pattern for the rest of the world so sea surface temperatures are probably only going to increase or decrease and become very heterogeneous across the entire world. So it's important to know how these changes can affect other places. And small scale fisheries also, also really largely contribute to the economies and food security of like communities worldwide. So if these small scale fisheries start turning sort of in a negative way, or start closing and people start doing other things how's that going to affect the communities and the food security of the people and the livelihoods of the people that, that live in these places and how does the use of coding language help you with this research well there'd be absolutely no way i'd be able to do the analysis that i wanted to do without coding it's just yeah i don't even know how i would do it if i didn't have the use of coding on my side basically uh and not only that but using coding just makes things that take that would take such a long time for using excel and stuff like that it's so much quicker and it also just reduces the like how much room for error there is if you've written in a code even though it takes longer to begin with because you've got to get out all of the errors once it's written it's way quicker why do you think data analysis and coding skills are becoming more and more in demand well I think in terms of exchanges across the world, what people want now is data. Like that's the currency that people are exchanging. When you think about all the social media platforms, 
all they want is people's data so it would be crazy to not have a like a, a mode in which the data analysis is improving across the world and coding just seems the natural route for it to go go down and there's also a need for efficiency and productivity so you know the the coding as i previously mentioned once it's right is so much faster than a human could do it and it's so much more efficient so i think in terms of our use of data is increasing and our need for it to be analyzed quicker is also increasing so i think that's why it's becoming more popular Hi, my name is Dylan Black. I'm a recent PhD graduate from Stanford, and today I'd like to tell you about the Chinese room. So suppose there's a man sitting in a room. He neither speaks nor reads Chinese, but he has an incredibly detailed Chinese phrasebook with him, which contains question and answer pairs for every possible question in Chinese. Every day, a note is passed to this man containing a question written in Chinese. The man looks up the question in his phrasebook, writes the appropriate response on the note, and sends it back out again. Does this man understand Chinese? On the one hand, the man does not speak Chinese, so how could he possibly understand it? However, if you are the person who's writing these notes and receiving detailed, correct responses in Chinese, if you have no understanding of what the man is doing, it sure looks to you like this man understands Chinese. So this argument is usually used to argue against the idea of machine consciousness, to argue that computers can't be conscious in the way that a human can. Uh, in this scenario, the computer would be the man in the room producing detailed, accurate responses, but who doesn't understand Chinese in the same way that we do. Now, why am I talking about this? Recently, the company OpenAI came out with a new large language model called ChatGPT that is, without exaggeration, the most mind-blowing piece of code that I've ever seen. First of all, what's a large language model? Well, it's essentially a giant statistical guessing engine. Given a prompt written in English, let's say, it predicts the word that is most likely to follow the given prompt, and you iterate this prediction over and over, and that allows it to generate whole sentences in natural language that, that actually make sense. And let me show you an example of ChatGPT in action. So here I'm asking it to find the derivative of a function in Python and then plot the result. It's decided to use the SymPy library, which is a, an excellent symbolic algebra uh, library in Python, which I suggest you all use. And then it's using matplotlib, which is a very common Python plotting library to, to plot the result. Its code is also beautifully commented, by the way. And so um, now I'm going to copy and paste this code into a JupyterLab uh, notebook and run it. And you can see that it does, in fact, uh, take the derivative correctly. Um, so it took the derivative correctly there and uh, it plotted it correctly. So here we saw ChatGPT write some simple Python code to take derivatives of functions and then plot them. Uh, did ChatGPT really understand my instructions in the way that you or I would understand another person speaking? I don't think so, but it's nearly impossible to tell the difference. And recently I did my own sort of Chinese room experiment on ChatGPT, where I told it to invent a fictional language spoken by slime people, and then speak to me in that language to test whether it really understood me, and it passed my test with flying colors. So first I had it invent some words in the slime language, which I called glorp. So food is slop in glorp, slime is gloop, mouth is slurp, and eat is splog. And so in glorp, the slime eats food with its mouth would be gloop, splog, slapa, slurpy. And uh, this language is very fun to say. After I, teaching it some basic grammar rules, I had a conversation with it. Flog, gloop, plapa, slurpy, I said. Gorp, gloop, flog, plapa, slurpy, it said. And the English translation of my question would be, does the slime hear the water with its mouth? And ChatGPT's answer was, yes, the slime hears the water with its mouth. That is totally correct. And so I probably spent about an hour teaching this statistical inference engine, like a, like a piece of code, a fictional slime language, and it was able to speak to me in it in increasingly complex sentences as I taught it more and more. This is absolutely incredible to me. And the, the best part of it was at the end, 
I asked it to generate some Python code that translated Glorp into English, and it did, and the code ran. Take a look. So here we see it's Glorp to English translation dictionary, and a function that will parse a sentence using regular expressions, remove the case endings of words, which is a linguistics term that basically means part of speech, and print the translated sentence in English with an escape clause that if it doesn't know a word, it prints a question mark. And there it translated a sentence. After these experiments, I think I have a different answer to the Chinese room thought experiment. I still don't think that the man in the room understands Chinese, but I think that the man and the phrase book taken together do understand Chinese in some sense. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video and seen some of the amazing things that you can do with machine learning, large language models, and code in general. And uh, as a shameless plug, if you would like to read the full transcript of me teaching uh, ChatGPT uh, how to speak in slime, uh, it's available on my blog that I write in my spare time called Maximum Effort, Minimum Reward. Bye. Thank you. Okay, well, we hope those videos have given you some ideas about potential applications for Python and data analysis. Um, there are a couple more exercises for you to complete in your workbook if you haven't done so already. And you can submit these to the RISE website to get your points, as well as a Future Me digital badge. There's also a list of further resources and courses that you can engage with if you want to develop your skills in this area further. We hope that you have found these notebooks and videos interesting and from all the creators on the course, well done.